Hello, my name is Mark Herman, and I'm the designer of Plan Orange, Pacific War, 1930 to 1935. Uh, this uh, particular effort was almost like a secret project that was done uh, in collaboration between myself, Roger McGowan, and Mark Simonich. Uh, I want to thank those two gentlemen for uh, their amazing uh, support for this uh, project, which I'll describe shortly. And I also want to give a major shout out to Francisco Comenares, who has uh, become a good friend, and he's the one who did all of the card uh, design for the playtest copies. So, uh, big shout out to him. And uh, so, let me, and also he's the guy making the Vassal module. So, uh, again, we all owe a great uh, deal of thanks to uh, Francisco. So, let me sort of walk you through uh, this game. Okay, so Plan Orange is a, first off, is a full game. It's not an expansion. You don't need anything else to play it. It comes complete in the magazine, number uh, C3I number 29. And so, uh, and it is totally based on my Empire of the Sun um, CDG uh, game system. Uh, the question I keep getting asked is, uh, is this a starter kit for Empire of the Sun? And the answer is no. It is Empire of the Sun, but in a 1932 uh, to 1933 base scenario. However, because it is a simpler situation, and I'll just sort of pan the map as I talk, uh, it's a simpler time because you don't have a war in Europe, you don't have uh, all the other foreign powers and allies. This is just the United States versus Japan, and there's uh, Japan in the distance. And so what it, what it does... Uh, where it is a little bit less complex in Empire of the Sun is that the political rules and progress of the war and all of that kind of stuff and is not in the game because it's not relevant to the situation. So the game is a little bit less complex in the number of options you have to deal with and, and all that, but from a game system point of view of how things move and react and all that, it's straight up Empire of the Sun, obviously with some uh, minor changes in you know the units and things that go into this scenario. Now, this uh, this game was inspired by this book that you see the cover of. Uh, this is obviously a reprint. The original book was published in 1925, and it was called the 1931 The Great Pacific War by Hector C. Bywater, who was a um, uh, a British uh, journalist, historian, naval, uh, pretty good, pretty uh, expert kind of guy in this situation, and. What I find interesting about this book, which I'm going to describe just quickly, is he got a lot of things right. So uh, in the book, the war begins over a China crisis. So does uh, Plan Orange, although not the one that he anticipated, obviously, because um, he wrote it in 1925. Uh, he does, in fact, uh, predict that airplanes with bombs and torpedoes will sink moving naval vessels, which nobody believed until it actually happened um, in the beginning of World War II when the Repulse and the um, Prince of Wales were sunk by the Japanese uh, off the coast of Malaya. Uh, again, Billy Mitchell at this time uh, has made his various experiments, so that's what Bywater is basing it on, but again, uh, he goes in that direction. Uh, he correctly describes the Japanese landings on uh, Lingayen Gulf and uh, Luzon, uh, uh, Mindanao, etc. Uh, he picks all the invasion beaches that were actually used in World War II, which I think is pretty, you know, geography is geography. Uh, he also uh, predicts in the, in the um, in the book, that Manila will surrender as an open city, which I think is interesting. You know, from a historical point of view, that's exactly what happened um, initially. Uh, also, that the Japanese would uh, uh, cheat on the Washington Treaty with a lot of light vessels, which you'll see in the order of battle as we as I walk you through some of the strategy in the game. He also looks at specialized Japanese submarines laying an offensive minefield off of Oahu uh, in a Pearl Harbor type of operation. So I thought that that was pretty interesting. And he does talk about Japan's vulnerability to a blockade, which is also part and parcel to uh, this game. And so, overall, I, I think he does a pretty interesting job of laying out uh, how the war would go. Now, what I did not do is this is not, uh, Plan Orange is not... Um, you know, takes doesn't take the event. It's not a uh, a redo of the book. It just takes the basic scenario and his thinking, and puts it into a historical context. Now, the game is actually. Hope I'm not making you uh, nauseous. Like zoom around here. 
This is Shanghai, and you'll see a red unit on top there. That's the the Shanghai crisis of 1932 is what starts the scenario. You'll see here, this is the 19th Chinese route army, which is uh, under Chiang Kai-shek and Sun Yat-sen. I think Sun Yat-sen is probably dead by now. I have to go look that up, but it's definitely Chiang Kai-shek. And you've got a Japanese, uh, you know, Marines and naval units are basically in a battle over the city of Shanghai. And what I postulate in the game, it, and then there's a, right over here, you'll see there's a China, so the game starts in uh, China crisis mode and so there's a China crisis box as you can see on the uh, map here. Uh, one of the nice things, uh, the Plan Orange map uses all of the uh, geographic analysis of Empire of the Sun but, and I'm going to see if I can pan this out now and you can really get a sense of you know what Mar uh, Mark Simonich did is, just to give you a sense, it's a, it's not, a, it is the geography but it's a total reset and recentering of the map so it runs from uh, obviously over here you've got and the, again this is all based on the plant orange you got Dutch Harbor sitting right here you've got Oahu over here and the last big base that was important was Funafuti which is down over here and it only goes over to as far as the Philippines and we use tr we use the size of the map rest of the size of the map for that but what's really interesting about uh, Plain Orange, which is different than Empire of the Sun, and it's probably one of the biggest changes, is I now have a strategic display. And so what you're looking at is, this is the U.S. East Coast, West Coast, the Panama Canal is open, the Caribbean, and so units actually, and these are the three bases, Dutch Harbor, Oahu, and Funafuti, and so basically units flow, get mobilized in the U.S., the big fleet, the, this, is, this force marker number five contains basically most of the U.S. fleet, not all of it, but you can see there's a lot of it. I'll describe it in some detail in a little few minutes. And, and so what happens in the game is that um, as the U.S. mobilizes, they shift units into here, which means they, put, they show up on the operational map. So you sort of have this strategic display operational thing, which is actually different than, um, than Empire of the Sun. And I think it adds a really an, an interesting uh, touch of flavor, but also allows me in the future to do other plan color of, of choice so you may see in the future you know the various plans for the Caribbean and against Germany or whatever as we kind of go forward and towards that end what I did was I did a lot of research on the actual orders of battle for these countries in this period of time and so you basically have the entire US Army, Navy, Army Air Corps, Marine Corps uh, order of battle and the same for the Japanese in this case. So basically, Japan is not, is, the army is not as large as it would be in World War II, which is about nine years from this period of time, this is 1932. Uh, but overall, you get, the, you get the effect of their operations in, uh, remember Manchuria has already occurred, so they're up in, the, up in that area. They have, you know, they own the, these various islands, they own Palau. Uh, and so now uh, this is the battle for the Western Pacific and the Japanese had war plans just like we did for how this war would go and again most of the Japanese possessions were attained through the Versailles Treaty these are in many cases these were um, uh, German uh, per, uh, colonies that became uh, Japanese uh, protectorates, mandated islands, etc. And, and, and then of course you have the US has this thin line so here you got the Philippines and then here you've got the U.S. base at Guam. Let me see if that's... There's Guam with Saipan right next to it. Then you shift over a little ways, and there's Wake Island. And then you shift over a little ways, and you see Midway. And then you go over here, and you see Oahu. So this is the U.S. supply line. You know, the way that they, they intended to get across the Pacific, you know, was through this chain of uh, bases, as you can see as I move it around the map. So, part of the Japanese effort is to cut this, sever this line, uh, take the uh, Philippines, and then <clears throat> basically at some point uh, fight the decisive naval battle, which is what their fleet was built for. And so this is the period of Jutland, not the period of uh, carrier battles. However, we're under the Washington Naval Treaties, and so part of the, the uh, effect of the Washington Naval Treaties was we, we had to get our, we had a bunch of ships that were under construction, and so you still have the very beginning, as you can see here, you have the Lexington and the Saratoga. Now, let me just quickly talk about the naval units. In Empire of the Sun, 
every so often I, I get asked this question. In Empire of the Sun, every single U.S. ship in the, on Japanese ship, etc., is in the order of battle, but they're organized as task forces. So a carrier group represents a couple of carriers, but then it has cruisers, and it has, the, you know, a light cruiser, uh, you know, like the land class light cruisers, and it has destroyers, and all of that into a task force format. And the same thing for the Japanese. So that's where all the destroyers are. However, I really wanted to show the differences in organization. And so each of these, each, this is the Saratoga. It has nothing else att attached to it. This is the Lexington. There's nothing else attached to it. Um, this is the fleet base. And in each of the battleships represents two battleships. And they're named exactly which two battleships. So effectively, you can see this Jutland-like battleship line as you maneuver across the Pacific. And, I, and one of the changes between uh, Empire of the Sun and, um, and Plant Orange to accommodate this is the stacking uh, limits are different. Uh, basically, they're doubled. Uh, so whereas in uh, Empire of the Sun, you can have three half-inch counters, you know, air, ground, and six naval counters, five-eighth-inch counters. In uh, Plant Orange, that's doubled to uh, 12, 6 and 12, respectively. And so what we did was you can get, typically you're going to get some large stacks, and so each side has five holding boxes that are just used to kill, you know, beat the clutter on the map. And so right now, this very large fleet, not yet, which is Force 5, is actually sitting here on the West Coast, and they're going to start to flow into the Pacific to fight this war. So, let me now uh, show you some of the cards. Okay, so first we're going to start with the uh, Japanese cards. Uh, the game starts with the Japanese playing on the first turn these two cards in their hand. They basically had the Filipino, you know, they, they basically start off with, um, you know, the initiative and the big attack. And so the game begins with the Japanese playing these two cards, and of course that's going to give them, you know, extra ASPs and, you know, surprise attack and all that kind of nonsense, which they can use to do anything they want. Uh, if you look at the victory conditions, uh, it's best that they, um, you know, basically use them for the titles, more or less, you know, invade the Philippines and get some big ground forces ashore and take out Guam to cut the, uh, to t you know, cut out the ability, U.S. ability to get across the Pacific easily on the opening. Uh, then, of course, uh, you get, uh, the both, both sides get a 24-card deck, and these are sleeved. Uh, obviously, these are not, um, you know, this is a magazine game, although I have to say the quality of the cards is really cool, and uh, really nice artwork. I, I would suggest, by the way, I have to go out and buy some. Uh, I just have to get to a store or something. Uh, this would be best with clear sleeves, good clear sleeves for these. Um, I didn't have any handy, so I'm using these with the red and blue backs, but, you know, you, they, it's got, you know, the usual great, amazing uh, Roger McGowan uh, artwork on the back of the cards. So that's the Japanese deck. So the way the game Plant Orange begins is the Japanese first play these two cards. The U.S. has no cards in hand. After the Japanese have played both of these cards, the U.S. draws two cards, which I'll reveal in a second, and the Japanese draws one additional card. So basically, the Japanese go twice, the Americans uh, play one of these two cards, then the normal sequence, the Japanese plays this card, and the U.S. plays this card. So effectively, that's how the first turn goes. And then thereafter, and one of the reasons why uh, Empire of the Sun uh, is a little bit longer playing is each hand of cards in Empire of the Sun, you get seven cards per turn, plus you can have a future offensive cue card. So sometimes, often you have, uh, you know, eight cards to play. Uh, in this game, your hand is only five cards, not seven, and there's no future offensive cue, so you can't save things into the next turn. I built that into the how the cards play. And so... Uh, that was uh, a, is a consideration. So the game should clock in at around, um, I would say, three hours on average. I mean, obviously your first game is going to go longer, but once you actually have, the, if you, and by the way, if you know how to play Empire of the Sun, once you've kind of been through the rules, you'll know most of the rules. You you'll just look at okay, I know all these rules, so they didn't change much. Uh, the biggest other biggest change in the game is between Empire of the Sun and this, and it's the one that makes the game really play quite a bit differently than Empire of the Sun is. Here's an air unit. Uh, they're all biplanes. And so, whereas in Empire of the Sun, you would have a two hex zone of influence, so all, everything around two hexes of this. And so, you, how you tie these bases together requires some range aircraft. In this period, the AZOI is just like a zone of control, it's just the hexes that are adjacent. So, 
the Pacific is far more porous as a consequence in this period because the plains uh, of 1940s, the late, 19, the late 30s and early 40s planes, the monoplanes, the better, higher performing engines don't come for another uh, seven to nine years, seven to eight years. And so these planes are the sort of the most advanced versions of what they had in World War I. And I think that US, the, the, seventh, uh, the US 7th Bomber Group actually has the first um, two engine um, monoplane bombers uh, in, in the game. And so it has a consequently a little bit better attack value. Another cool thing, I, would, I have to sort of show this because, you know, it, it may be the only game I ever do like this. Where is it? It's next to the Japanese card, and there it is. We have the U.S. The U.S. had these um, dirigible aircraft carriers called the Macon and the Akron, and so you've got this really cool uh, Zeppelin-like piece. Not much of an air unit, but it has, unlike the other units, it has a three-hex... AZOI for intelligence purposes. So in other words, you can move this, it's got, you know, obviously 10 hex range. Uh, it really moves, you can really move it around, but it's really good at, um, for intelligence purposes, and it has a little bit of an air defense uh, capability with the, you know, these, uh, I think each one carried seven of what they called sparrow hawks or something, and they, and the whole, this had this crazy system where they hooked on, and you can read all about it, but it's just an interesting period. They were both destroyed in storms after the, when this scenario occurred. But this is when the period when they were built into the uh, Plan Orange war plans. So they're in the game. So there's the uh, Akron, the Macon and the Akron for, for this particular effort. So let me describe a little bit about how things typically go in this game in the victory conditions and all that, and then we'll kind of call it a, a day. So back in a second. Right now we're looking at the Philippines and its defenses. Uh, you know, it's very, very similar to what you're going to see in World War II. Uh, what, one of the Jap so the way the Japanese win this game is, one, they don't lose the game by turn six. So it's only a six-turn game, as you can see from the track here. Uh, it's uh, 1932 to 19, it's only six turns. Each turn, every three turns is a year. And so this is a two-year limited war. This is not uh, unconditional surrender and, you know, and all that other kind of jazz. Uh, I don't. I don't predicate uh, the beginning of this game on a uh, attack on Pearl Harbor, but you know, hey, you can do it if you if you if you so choose. And it's also presumed that this would have a more, uh, again, typical Japanese would open. You know, the Japanese started the Russo-Japanese War, um, World War II, and it would be presumed in this period they would start with, uh, you know, declaring war just as they're attacking, which was a you know kind of one of their standard tactics, which the U.S. was aware of even in World War II, and was you know they built their plans around it, so they weren't wouldn't have been surprised that. They were trying to be surprised, but historically, surprises usually uh, are successful. So, if you're looking for it. So, here's the Philippines, and the main Japanese invasion fleet is sitting here, and it comprises a bunch of destroyers, etc. And, and remember, this is the, in the, you've got the, um, Got some battle cruisers. You got a plane, and this is the uh, sort of the the invasion fleet. So let's see if we can shoot at a little bit here. So this is kind of what's sitting in um, in the uh, Formosa, uh, now called Taiwan, but then called Formosa. And so you've got this kind of fleet sitting there, and it's more than enough to um, get this uh, core ashore in the Philippines uh, on the opening of the game. Uh, and so what you're trying to do with the Japanese is, you know, as Bywater discussed and how it happened historically, you probably want to invade either here or over here. You can go straight at Manila, but the Manila, by the way, you should you note on top, I'll try to zoom in a little bit on it, uh, there was a railroad gun. So we've got a railroad gun. I never had a railroad gun in the game. So we've got a railroad gun. It only moves between Clark and Manila, um, but it gives you some advantages, uh, gives you some firepower. And uh, so you've got that situation, but you know again, uh, and, is, and, and there's a decent size uh, force under here. So probably you're going to want to come in at uh, at you know uh, uh, over at Clark Air Base here, uh, as they did historically. To make the Philippines surrender, you have to capture Manila, Leyte, and Davao. That's a little bit different than Empire of the Sun. And once that's taken, uh, then it's up to the Japanese player whether they want to take Guam out and cut that capability and how they reinforce the Pacific and whether they try to kick wake in midway, etc. 
Uh, so those are sort of the basic options. Now, how do, how do the Americans win the game is uh, as follows. And I'm going to cover one of them last. Uh, the first one is uh, the Americans basically blockade Japan from the, the Chinese mainland. So basically, if you can capture um, Port Arthur, Pusan, you know, if you can ca get, get control of these ports in here, um, that will blockade Japan. And that's all covered in Rule 13.43. Uh, where no Japanese home island port hex can trace a path to Seoul or via Port Arthur to Harbin or Mukden. So as long as you can't trace a supply to the uh, resources of here, you're considered to be blockaded. Uh, it's a little bit simpler to do. And one of the things that's important for the American strategy in this game is that um, you must, you know, if, if you are don't threaten, and you can, remember you have army divisions, you can in fact, uh, this is a much smaller, Japanese only had 12 divisions in this period of time, and so one of the real strategies for the Americans is also just to land and take out these ports and actually fight a, fight a land war in Asia, as it were. You can actually send troops into that area. And they had been there, by the way, at the end of World War I. They had been in the Vladivostok area, so it's not like they, they didn't have knowledge of this area. And so that's one of the strategies. So the Americans have to always be able to threaten this attack to either blockade or um, actually or, and, or invade and take those... Uh, take those bases away from the Japanese to cut them off and win it on a blockade victory. The other way is to actually invade the home islands. And again, much less um, uh, militarization. And the, uh, now these red uh, squares do represent um, intrinsic defenses, but there are only threes in this particular game. So they're not twelves, and so it is quite possible if the Japanese denude, you know, these are the sort of the district armies that are protecting um, Japan, and if the Japanese pull all their forces out of Japan, which is also often common in um, Empire of the Sun, because I account for the fact that there's a large home army that never leaves uh, the islands, that was not the case in 1932. And so the Japanese need to remember that you don't have to garrison uh, the islands, but the, but the Americans could actually invade and conquer Hangzhou uh, uh, much easier than they could have done in World War II because of the you know, lack of defenses uh, in this period of time. So that's another way to win. Now the last one is, think of this as Jutland. So this is the main Japanese, this is Curry and the main Japanese fleet. And you'll note, you know, you have, oh, you have the Hosho, which is a light carrier, but you have, you know, this is the famous Japanese battleship line uh, represented by those three pieces. Uh, each of those is two battleships. So you've got basically six Japanese battleships and then you've got the three battle cruisers. So you've got a total of ten um, remember the battle cruisers were over here. So you've got your battle line is sort of sitting around 10 uh, steps, plus uh, light ships, uh, cruisers, and destroyers count as um, sort of half steps towards naval parity. And so the way that the Japanese or the Americans can win the game is anytime the capital ship ratio from game turn four or later, so in the first year of the war, that this doesn't apply, but once you get into the second year of the war, if the U.S. has two times or, or more BB naval steps, I mean, everything's being converted into battleship steps here, uh, you have twice as much navy uh, as counted by the rules than the Japanese, you win basically an automatic uh, naval supremacy, Mahanian kind of victory. The flip side of that is, um, uh, uh, the flip side of this is at the end of turn four or later, the Japanese have a 1.5 or more. So if the Japanese actually have one and a half times more capital, you know, Navy than the U.S. has on the map. So basically, one of the, you know, one of the dodges is you need to bring, you can't stay off the map. So if you don't bring these ships that are in Force 5 onto the map, you know, you could lose the game by not getting them, you know, into the map, which you have a whole year to do, which is not a problem. But again, it just sort of keeps you honest. And so if the Americans get twice as much naval power in the game as the Japanese, they win outright. The Japanese can get 1.5 times as much naval power on the map uh, as the Americans, they win outright. And then, if neither of those, those three conditions apply, then the game ends on game turn six as a Japanese victory that they were able to hold on long enough to um, get a reasonable settlement at the peace table. And so that sort of covers uh, that aspect of the game. Beyond that, I uh, don't know what else to say. Uh, so what I have seen typically, just to kind of give a quick strategy over here, the Japanese are likely, just because of the victory conditions, are going to basically grab the Philippines. Uh, they're going to probably grab Guam, maybe uh, even Wake. And then all these American naval force, and by the way, there's naval, Americans have naval force that they have to mobilize. There's a whole set of rules, there's one simple set of rules on mobilization of the army and additional air power and additional naval units. 
because uh, some of them are in refit. And, and by the way, one of the big deficiencies in the U.S. fleet in this period was it was very deficient in light ships. Uh, it was just a dimension of they were very, they did not have a lot of they had they had very few cruisers, uh, and they definitely had very few destroy they were under destroyered. So you don't have a lot of light ships. That, you know, so you got a big battle fleet, yet you do not have a lot of light ships. And so, uh, just like Empire of the Sun, you can do these, um, you know, these pinning kind of attacks where you launch a, a light ship or an airplane to lock up a space so they can't react. Although in this game, the air power, it's much harder to do because the airplanes are just not that good. However, you don't have much of those light ships and they all count towards this naval uh, equation. So, yes, you can do certain things that you can do in Empire of the Sun. You know, you can launch these little night raids and night battles, which by the way were much more possible in this period than they would have been in World War II, although it happened on a number of occasions. Yet, uh, if you do that, uh, you're likely to lose, you know, those cruisers and destroyers and you could, in, a, in essence, lose the game without fighting Jutland. And one of the cool things about this game is a lot of the games that I've seen, one side or the other realizes that they're not going to win, and so as a consequence, they seek the big battle. And so I've seen numerous um, Jutlands in this game, which was kind of what the the raison d'etre of what these you know the strategy was in this period, and uh, so and what these fleets were built for. And so you can, in essence, see a big uh, you know after the Japanese uh, use certain cards to attrit the, the Americans or. You know, they have some things go wrong, or they hit some airplanes get lucky, or whatever. There are submarines, so submarines take a couple of hits. And before you know it, you could find yourself in a vulnerable position, and the other side sorties out, and, you know, it's, it all goes down to who wins the Battle of Jutland so, uh, in the Pacific. So there's sort of a quick rundown of uh, the situation for Plan Orange. Well, I think that's going to be it for today. I wanted to at least give you a little bit of a heads up and kind of see, let you see what Plan Orange kind of looks like, give you a couple of thoughts, some of the differences. But again, as I said earlier, this is a standalone game, requires no prior knowledge of Empire of the Sun to play. It comes with its own, um, you know, complete, complete rule booklet, uh, separate, you know, so you got a full set of rules, you've got uh, 48 cards and two uh, national 24 card decks, uh, you've got uh, 99 half inch counters and 36 5 8 inch counters that gives you the entire order of battle of the, of the Japanese Empire and the US um, military at that period in 1932 and um, and, oh, and by the way there's a, a second scenario which is 1935 where you get a few more aircraft carriers like um, the Ranger and the Ryu who uh, show up as you get a few more carriers as you get into 35 but then after 1935 uh, this these fleets then started to transform and so uh you'd have to do another then you're really getting into the empire of the sun period uh, i might at some point do a earlier 1920s uh, kind of battle using the same map maybe just put some counters in and a scenario card and we could play a 20 scenario and even getting to the point where you would still have coal ships and i'm kind of i think that would be kind of an interesting variant but anyway uh this is what you get uh in this package uh, keep uh, keep uh, looking at the C3I folder, and Roger McGann will be giving out uh, ordering information very shortly, but there you have it. So uh, this is Mark Herman signing off, and I hope you uh, get excited and uh, play Plan Orange. Bye.